Uh, my name is Sara Stevano. Uh, I am a postdoctoral fellow in the economics department uh, here at SOAS. Uh, and I would like to welcome you all to this seminar on behalf of uh, the SOAS research cluster on uh, food nutrition and health uh, in uh, development. Uh, um, this is a, a new research cluster led by the economics department, uh, bringing together academics and PhD students uh, working on issues of uh, food, nutrition and health uh, in uh, uh, lower and uh, middle, low, uh, middle income countries. Uh. Um, so, uh, the research cluster is led by Professor Jane Harrigan, who is here, and also uh, by Dr. Deborah Johnson, who unfortunately uh, is not able to be with us today because she's busy. Um, so, on behalf of the cluster, I would like uh, to welcome Professor Tim Lang. We are very pleased to have him here as a speaker of our first uh, public seminar. Um, Tim Lang is Professor of Food Policy uh, at the Centre for Food Policy at City University London. Uh, I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, uh, a lot of his work. He's been uh, working for many years uh, on uh, the relationship between uh, food, nutrition and health uh, with a specific focus on uh, policy, um, if that's correct. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm not going to mention all of the roles uh, that uh, Professor Tim Lang uh, had, uh, but I want to say that Tim was a full commissioner on the Sustainable Development Commission between 2006 and 2011, and a member of the Council of Food Policy Advisors uh, between 2008 and 2010. He's currently a member of the London Food Board, uh, advising uh, the Mayor of London since 2009. Um, he has written extensively uh, on the subject. Uh, the one thing that I want to mention is that the talk he's going to give today uh, will give us a flavour of his new co-author book, uh, Sustainable Diets, and the title is uh, right there uh, on the first slide. Um, and uh, perhaps I should also say that some of his uh, very recent work is on Brexit and food policy, so any of you interested in the subject should check out uh, his work on that. Um, I will hand over to Tim. Uh, the way it's going to work is that uh, Professor Tim Lang is going to speak for about 20-25 uh, minutes. Uh, then Professor Jane Harrigan, who are going to introduce them, uh, is going to give a short discussion. And then we'll have time for questions and answers. Uh, so this should last for about uh, an hour from now. Okay, over to you Tim. Okay, thank you, thank very, you much. very much. Sorry. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I, when I was sort of, I couldn't remember whether I said to Sarah I would do any slides at all, and now I'm regretting it actually, because I think I've done about 40 slides. It breaks <laughs> all the rules that one should do in 20 minutes. I'd actually forgotten it was a 20 minute. But I mean, I, I'm, uh, I mean, I can say what the talk is now, and you can go to sleep and wake up in 25 minutes. Um, uh, basically, this term, sustainable diets, has come in to mean diets which are not just good for health, but good for the environment. That's the simplistic view. Um, we in our centre tend to champion and explore the, the more complex view, which I'll talk about, which is that it's also culture, it's economics, it's other things. Um, but essentially why we're talking about it is because food is the main driver of climate change, water use, Tony Allen, my, my guru here in the room at the front from SARS and Kings, uh, biodiversity loss, you name it, food is the big factor. It's the big factor in non communicable diseases. It's the big shaper, it's the biggest employer on the planet. You know, if we don't sort out this, essentially we're in very serious trouble. So this term sustainable diet has come to be a code for thinking through. <coughs> the consumption end of the food system. Okay, so I'm a food systems type of thinker. My friend Ben Fine here from Sales also likewise where was, well, we were young when we started, but now we're the, the old farts. Um, um, that, uh, we mean, we, sorry, not, not in Ben's case, but he's, he's a young fart. Uh, where uh, where uh, we've been doing it for 40 years, trying to apply a new understanding of, of how food works and the supply chains and what it means and the inequalities of power. So when I use a term like food systems, 
I'm meaning a structural analysis, not um, just a sort of a narrow dietitian's view or something. Uh, I tend to do a headline chapter heading sort of like this. Okay, so what's the problem? Let's, we can do this very quickly. Um, I've said it. It's basically health. The, the evidence about this is now just overwhelming. We have a problem of overwhelming evidence not being answered. That's our problem. The problem is not what are we, what's going wrong. We know what's going wrong. There are some bits that we're arguing about, but not much. Uh, and it's immediately, I think, a, a complexity problem. Uh, you can go, and what I do as a generalist, as a policy analyst, we go across all of these different disciplines, different takes, and essentially in all of these, the problems are coming up. The slides are for you, so you don't, I'll go through them very far. I mean, just start with health. If there's one thing that gets people's attention, it's usually health. I mean, food is the cluster, uh, or the cross-cutting issue that explains the cluster, of the main causes of uh, disease. Uh, you know, the, the global burden of disease done by the World Bank and the World Health Organization initially has been updated many times. The methodology changes. It doesn't matter whether you look at standard epidemiology or look at global burdens of disease and DALIs and qualies and all of these metrics. It comes out that diet is now actually the biggest factor. It causes all these deaths. But the, what's involved is this key notion my good friend Barry Popkin planted about 25 years ago, this notion of the nutrition transition. Fast as we get this evidence, the world carries on going through the nutrition transition. It's eating differently. The moment we get more affluent, we start eating like the rich, or how only the rich used to live. And the result is a very contrary public health world. Uh, the costs are just astronomic. You know, I'm not someone, as Ben knows only too well from discussions we had well, 30 years ago, I'm not someone who thinks that economic factors shape what politicians and policymakers do. Because here, for decades, we've had evidence of the costs of ill health and diet related. And yet, the food system carries on churning out overproduction, malproduction, malconsumption, and externalized costs. If, if the evidence from economists really did have an impact on policy, the data would surely overwhelm it. And the big thing is now that the costs are in the lower middle income areas, exactly your area. The rich world is, um, can barely afford it, but the middle and low income countries cannot. And this is away from that area. The, you know, this is, again, my uh, good friend Johan Rockström and Will Stephanie in, in, in Australia. Rockström at the Stockholm uh, uh, Resilience uh, Institute. This work that they're looking at planetary boundaries, uh, not as food, but just looking at how is planet Earth doing, and basically it's not doing very well. And across all of the main... Um, boundary issues that these interdisciplinary uh, scientists are looking at, these planetary scientists are looking at, food is, accounts for uh, about 60% of them. It doesn't matter where you look in the evidence thing. If you look at getting more honed into food, the uh, FAO's uh, uh, Livestock's Long Shadow report in the mid-2000s and then updated by also Steinfeld, who I know, a good agricultural economist who's head of the division at FAO. Uh, they redid all the data and found, you know, whichever way you look at it, uh, uh, particularly meat is a driver of greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, the FAO was trying to give a positive spin to all of this and say, look, the best farmers with the lowest emissions, the best management of emissions, can reduce emissions from cattle by 30%. But then on page 43, I think it was, you know, if the world carries on eating more meat, all of those efficiency gains are worked <coughs> out. In other words, somewhere along the line, a big issue of livestock has to be addressed. Whether we look at it at national level, by land use, by different types, you know, Brazil, they can chop down the whole of the rest of the Amazon. Um, but it's still actually, there's a squeeze on land. This is grid, uh, unit grid Arundel data. 
you know, I always look at India because I was a child brought up in India. Uh, and you just see that this is by hectare. You know, Brazil's got four and a half hectares per person in population terms. India, about a third of a hectare. And then you look at the land use, forest pastures, cropland, and other. Uh, cropland is the interesting one because that's plants. That's what we really depend on. And if we spend our cropland feeding animals there, we're making the cows uh, to compete with us. That's problematic in India for religious reasons, as I'm sure you know. There is a very big difference in different regions of the world, different nation states. Uh, we've got Tony here. Um, you know, just this is my standard, one of my standard slides from Chapkin and Herkstra. You know, the, the average Westerner eating one burger, you know, a uh, 100 gram burger is basically using two and a half thousand litres of embedded water. This is uh, you might say, okay, that's fine in wet Britain. Well, actually, get real. Britain is not wet, actually. Uh, the southeast of England is water stressed. In North Wales, where part of my family are from, it is wet. So, what are we talking about? Relocating where we grow animals if we grow them? What does it mean? Well, you can't grow wheat on the mountains of Snowdonia. <coughs> it's wet. But it's not a great place to grow and harvest cereals. So if you're feeding cereals to your animals, which is what the world does, this is a problem. And this is the squeeze, the notion of a squeeze. Thinking of you lot, here are the figures on rice. Uh, you know, I had cancer about 12 years ago, and uh, all I wanted when I was in the hospital having operations was to eat my childhood food of rice and dal. You know, I'm a psychologist gone wrong, I should not be surprised by this. Uh, the rice and dal is actually very heavy, well the dal is not so much, but the rice, wow, look at the embedded water in the rice. If there's one crop that comes out as under threat from climate change, it's actually rice. Uh, meantime, on the social dimension, you know, we've got 1.7 billion people overweight and obese, and only about 0.9 hungry. Uh, this is a messy world. We've got this nutrition transition going on, of uh, sweeping into more and more what the great Brazilian nutritional uh, epidemiologist Carlos Monteiro at uh, uh, Sao Paulo University calls ultra-processed foods, a shift from simple diets to ultra-processed diets, which are made in factories, with the fats and the salts and the sugars and the um, what we in my world call the new adulterations happening. This is a, a shift which has been an indicator of success. Don't let's forget that. Uh, and it's happening very rapidly. This is from my colleague and indeed my replacement as director of our Centre for Food Policy at City, Corinna Hawkes, is co-editor uh, co of the World uh, Nutrition Report, but this is from the Globe Panel Report that she co-wrote for the Global Panel of Experts on Agriculture. It came out a couple of months ago, and this is worth looking at. It doesn't matter, lower income, middle income, sorry, upper middle income and higher income. Uh, the blue is ultra-processed foods, just in every area except the high. And the high, high income, countries like Britain, the United States, the OECD, rich elements of the OECD, consumption of ultra-processed foods is levelling off. But look at the level it's got to, you know? And it's this that worries us, this upward rise. And indeed, the shift from cooking food to receiving pre-prepared food is a key, key part of the picture I'm painting to you. You can look at these later. This is from Carlos Monterey's paper as well. I'm going to go through this faster. Um, to get it to the economics, don't let's forget, um, actually I regret putting this slide in because I've, I've just done a, a better one, um, uh, uh, of literally figures of the, the prices since so 1860s. Um, essentially, food prices have come down over the last century and a half uh, in world terms and in rich countries. It's varied by country and varied by circumstance. But this is the, uh, the FAO food price index over the last 50 years from 1961 to 2016. It's literally last month, so it's pretty up to date. 
And you see, this is basically the banking and oil crisis. And if I had done a longer graph, I'd have shown you, you know, World War I, World War II, it went up, and then it was oil. It's moved from war crises to oil crises. And sometimes they're the same. Uh, here's a nice way of showing it's not just food, uh, but how oil peaks. Here is the 19, early 1970s. These are agricultural fertilizers and energy prices. And you see fertilizer rockets at the moment, I think. And it's fertilizers that has given big increase of output in the last 70 years. It's not uh, agrochemicals, it's fertilizers. Uh, this is a long slide a lovely piece of work done by USDA, ERS, which I really like, Economic Research Services, over a hundred years, basically, it was in 1909 to basically 2000. You could see how the US, actually, the US had very high availability of calories um, in the 18th and 19th centuries, which was one of the reasons people emigrated, and it got squeezed, actually, but then it rose, too, in the United States. It's all in the second half, post-Second World War, we're dealing with what we call the new food revolution. It's the productionist paradigm. What was the next colleague of Ben's, Michael Eastman, and I wrote a book called Food Wars. It's all in that, if you want to look at it. A new edition came out last year. But what is interesting is that in uh, the amount of money over time, this is from 1929 in the States to 2000, um, uh, the amount of money people spend in the nutrition transition goes down, even though in real terms it's going up. So it's uh, quite important for you need to buy more nice cashmere jumpers and, uh, and take your kids on holiday and um, go and eat uh, burgers with your mates after boring lectures by professors. <laughs> I've said this really, but I really want to stress this on sustainable diets. Look at this later, and I put it in actually because here we are at the SOAS. Um, the meat eating, the, the top meat eating countries. The, the thing that governments do not want to face is meat. They just don't want to face it. And you can see why when you start looking at where the high meat consumptions are. Um, I'm not going to go into that in any more details. It's not just meat, by the way. There are very different pictures. This is from great studies by Ripple uh, and colleagues. Different, different animals have different emissions. Methane, I'm sure you know, is 24 times more um, climate change inducing than CO2. Um, uh, but it, the problem is ruminants rather than rice, but rice ain't particularly good either. So this, this is why the theme I'm giving you is sustainable diets. Is it just simply nutrition plus environment, or is it <coughs> nutrition plus culture plus price plus social issues? I think it is, and that's what I've come to say. I think we cannot address the challenges that are coming from the evidence about the food system unless we get a grip over what uh, Pamela Mason might call in her book, a multi-criteria approach to sustainable diets. So what do we mean by sustainable diets? Well, one of my heroines, uh, Joan Gasson, a very nice woman, still alive, uh, a nutritionist at Columbia, um, and Kate Clancy, a PhD student, first wrote a very short paper in 1987 where the term was first coined, and it's sort of grand. I was an immediate early fan of it. And basically what they meant by it was nutrition plus environment. Okay, Joan, a very keen organic gardener, and her husband, you know, she's a wonderful woman. She was thinking about ecosystems <coughs> things, as any of us from the 1960s do. Uh, and the most pared down, I sat on the government, Sarah, you know, kind introduction to me, I was on various committees at the end of the Labour government when the, um, um, when the banking and oil crisis had happened, they suddenly panicked and said, my God, we've got to sort out our food problems, it's not just low income, it's us. Uh, and we had a huge fight inside the British state machine over some reports called the Food Matters Report, if you're interested in it. And basically, the compromise across Whitehall was that the British state would say, yeah, OK, the British food system's got a shift to address nutrition plus environment, or actually heart disease plus carbon. Okay. So that was the compromise. And the food industry was, enough of it was prepared to buy into that. And actually, we were prepared to compromise. 
uh, say, okay, that's good, because if you lower carbon, you're lowering meat, actually, and you're doing all sorts of other hiddens. But the evidence, even this very quick cook's tour I've given you, uh, says that the, it's more complex than just nutrition and carbon. It's culture, it's people's aspirations, it's what they want, it's their pleasure, it's, you know, there are social dynamics to food. I'm a social scientist, I suspect some of you are too. So it becomes this issue, I've already read here, the issue of sustainable diet, what's changed since Joan Gussell and Kate Clancy did their paper <coughs> 30 years ago, is uh, complexity. But that, in political terms and policy terms, is tricky. No politician wants to say it's complex. <laughs> they want something very simple. Okay, so I'm now speaking as a pragmatist. Someone who's had to be on inside on the machine, but also studies it. Okay? And you can get a toe in the door with a simple issue, and as long as you're dragging the complexity behind you, fine, then you get change, and we're actually beginning to do that. But that's a different talk. I have the pleasure and privilege of chairing, <laughs> co-chairing the FAO's report, uh, sorry, the FAO's scientific uh, symposium to review and think about sustainable diets. And we got, I chaired uh, the uh, element strand of that that came up with this definition, which I'm not going to read out, um, which is now obviously highly cited. This is the UN, so it's quite useful. And you can see the complexity. You can see certainly mine. My job is to steer um, you know, this vast uh, group of people into agreeing something that's multi-criteria. So it's moved on from the Clancy, and, <coughs> Kate Clancy and uh, uh, um, Joan Gassar. Um, well, but this is the difficulty policymakers have. How are we doing? Are we doing okay? Um, there is an evidence policy gap, is the picture I'm giving you. If you think policy is made by evidence, grow up. <laughs> it's not how it is. Sometimes evidence is very important. Very often, policy is completely ignores evidence. And that's not just a conspiracy. Very, very rarely is it a conspiracy, <coughs> actually. Uh, it is much more that there are bad champions, no one's organizing it, no one's articulating it, hasn't been translated. You know, there are other dynamics to the policy making. But the reality is we have an odd evidence policy gap. Uh, we've got a problem which is for 70 years the food system has been asked to do what it's done. Produce more, intensify, enable food to get cheaper, feed people's aspirations, burgers on every store, on every corner. This is liberty. Uh, professionally, part of the problem has been that the academics, we're all so driven, I don't need to say that in Britain, we're all reft, and then our little silos, being judged for how successful you are, work harder is always rule number one. I mean, this, this is bonkers, when actually we need to put across the evidence, uh, walk across the evidence and put it together. That's what we should be doing as academics. So it's been hard. It's not, we've not had any. And I think the problem for me, I, I, I don't know what uh, Jane will think, but I think there's a, a political failure here. Not just a political failure of academics, it's a political failure generally. But I'm going to give you some good news on that. Uh, in a moment. Well, um, it is complex, but then you go to Qatar, which I can never say pronounce correctly. Qatar. 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 <laughs> Whichever way I say it is wrong. Yes. <laughs> that one. There's Qatar. Okay? It's got sustainable dietary guidelines. Did you know that? It's astonishing. My PhD student was the person who wrote them. Is, is there a connection? <laughs> but the interesting thing is, uh, hey, do they practice it? Well, that time will tell. We'll see what difference it makes. But uh, why and how did that happen when the United States last year rejected turning its five yearly reviewed dietary guidelines for Americans, which the scientific 
advisory group had worked for two years and produced, I think, a 500-page report on the reasons why there should be environmental factors in the dietary guidelines, the Secretary of State for Agriculture in the U.S. turned it down. What? 35,000 submissions were made to the consultation process. Uh, I don't know how many, but <coughs> let's, let's be charitable. Maybe 1,000 came from the food industry. Uh, 33,000, 32,000 were from everyone else saying we want them to become sustainable dietary guidelines. But the Secretary of State for Agriculture out voted the Secretary of State for Health and the Dietary Guidelines for Americans ignored environment. So the biggest emitter uh, of diet-related uh, greenhouse gases put its head in the sand. So we've got the democratic, evidence-based, scientifically literate America says no, we've got Qatar, a small oil government uh, delivers something. How has this happened? That's very interesting, politically. Uh, <coughs> what Pamela Mason and I have done in our book is ended up saying, okay, well, we are where we are. Uh, we've reviewed lots of different things. Different governments, you know, tell the story of the Americans and Qatar. The most interesting story of all is Sweden, <coughs> Sweden was the first country to produce evidence-based sustainable dietary guidelines in 2008-9. It's Environmental Protection Agency and it's National Food Administration, so it's two scientific bodies, worked for a year and a half, two years, and produced a report published, being good Swedes, everything's in the open, environmentally conscious guidelines or advice for uh, environmentally conscious consumers. Um, being good Europeans, they submitted it to the European Food Safety Authority as the sort of overarching responsible body for the European Union who told them to remove them. And this is a very murky bit of politics. It is strongly suspected that a very big American meat company, Smithfields, then owned by the Americans, now owned by the Chinese, which had bought all the former Soviet Union and Polish meat uh, interests in Eastern Europe, uh, lobbied through the Polish government to get them withdrawn. And the reasons for them being withdrawn was that the Swedish Dutch and Guidelines said, if possible, to eat locally and eat seasonally. And that was against the single market. Well, that's maybe an ostensible reason. The point is, in, in Australia, something very similar happened. In Britain, we started going down the route. It was the era I was involved. And then the coalition government came in and stopped in the first month after election. It stopped the project of creating integrated advice for consumers, linking health and environment, being done through the Food Standards Agency. And then why is this going on? What on earth is wrong with saying to the public in Rich countries, poor countries, actually we've got to eat within environmental limits for health, for culture. But apparently this is very hot politics. Uh, so, um, the journey so far, I think just the evidence is going up. You know, if you use a tide analogy, there was a rush up in the late 2000s and it's been driven back, but it's building up, actually not at the national level, but at, at the international level and at the local level. A very interesting move happening at cities. I was in Milan in October on World Food Day, October the 16th, and the day before we launched the Milan Urban Food Policy Pact, which was signed by 100 so-called world cities. Actually, it was very moving. I'm not easily moved, but I was moved, actually. We were in a building that the British bombed uh, when trying to uh, uh, drive the fascists out of Italy in 1944, 43-44, um, uh, which the Italians had restored very beautifully right next to the Milan Cathedral, which is a stunning building, uh, if you've never seen it. And the Italians decided they would 
not rebuild it, but they've restored it so that it was safe. And now it's the key meeting hall of the city. So here we are in something the British had bombed, but all over the world there were mayors from, you know, Shanghai, Beijing, Copenhagen, Melbourne, you know, every continent except Antarctica. Uh, I won't go into here, but we've got at the global level, we've got this really interesting slow growth at the UN level. ICN2 International Conference on Nutrition, the Sustainable Development Goals passed last year um, and signed and now ratified by half of this Mr. Trump tears, uh, tears them up, which he might, well he might. Um, you cannot deal with the 17 SDGs unless you deal with food. You can't do it. In which case, you know, the, the picture I'm trying to paint is of the, the move for sustainable diets is inexorable unless it's political. Uh, we've got experimentation happening at the national level, but not getting anywhere. No country except Qatar has it. Sweden was made to withdraw it, but then came back with new cultural guidelines, so they didn't give up, which was terrific. Uh, but actually the enthusiasm is down here, and I've put the link there if you want to look at it. It's now 120 cities have signed up. So what are the issues arising? Why does this matter for SOAS? I think because, well, for people like me, there's a very important issue of formal versus informal guidelines, the difficulty of multi-criteria approaches, uh, which we can talk about more. But what can LDCs do? If you don't know the literature, bit by bit, I am very heartened, because this used to be a discourse that was seen as the rich consumer world. This is where fancy people inhabited. But it's not if your country has a massive NCD, it's non communicable diseases. It's not if your country is in the front line of climate change. And that's why this is becoming a hot development issue. If you don't know them, the ODI reports are good. I've put them there. Here's Qatar and here's Brazil. I think Brazil has made a, an absolute blinder on this. Their National Dietary Guidelines Review was led by Carlos Monteiro, conveniently. And he, who uh, we're close with, uh, gets the point and stuck to the brief that this was re re revising nutrition guidelines, but proof them against the environment, didn't do uh, make them sustainable dietary guidelines, but said, actually, if we follow the nutrition guidelines we're recommending, the environmental footprint will come down. But they sold it to the ministry and to the, Bra the Brazilian public on cultural grounds. And here they are. And this was the blinder. You can look at through these later. I mean, essentially, they're talking very everyday language, which I like. Uh, and it, you know, they, this is the official, passed by the Minister of Health. Avoid fast food chains. Think very carefully if something's been advertised. You know, these are the messages that actually are needed if we're going to address the enormity. Be critical of commercial advertising of food products. Whoa! <laughs> is this boy happy? You know, a child in the world today has seen 10,000 advertisements within their first three years. You know? We talk about democracy and power. Actually, over food, it's a walkover. Now, don't lose sight. There are very powerful forces. Here's one of the richest men in the world uh, going down the route of funding uh, lab-based meat. That burger cost a quarter of a, a billion dollars. Okay. Uh, there are all sorts of possibilities to deal with the objective evidence I started with. All sorts. So don't lose sight of those. But I think what's interesting is if you look at this issue of sustainable diet through the multi-criteria lens, you'll see that there are very interesting pressures building up on all sorts of fronts. In companies, I always said PepsiCo is my second least favoured company on the planet 
if ever I meet anyone from PepsiCo, I say, I really want you to go bust tomorrow, and then we'll be feel better. Uh, for some reason, they don't take any notice of me. Uh, but they did astonishing things in Britain. They're experimenting in this 50 and 5, where is it? Have I got it? 50 and 5 commitment. They've reduced their greenhouse gas emissions in Britain as an experiment by 40% in five years. I mean, you have to say that's quite interesting. Now, why are they doing it? They're doing it out of self-interest. It's not out of altruism. They want to be around. So, even though the politics has pushed back sustainable dietary guidelines, there are some very paradoxical counter forces coming forward to say we have to do things. This is the biggest pasta company in the world, Barilla. These are very famous, actually very good, uh, and it's a really extraordinary company in some respects. They get the point. Um, uh, they've done this inverted uh, pyramid, so there are lots of things. I mean, here companies replacing the state is giving guidance. Yeah, this is messy. We're not happy with this. Actually, they're not happy with it. Uh, different countries have been doing different things. I've told you that. Uh, the biggest conservation body in the world, WWF, uh, concluded ten, six years ago that if it really was bothered about pandas, albatrosses, uh, and polar bears, it had to help stop the nutrition transition. So a conservation society has become the biggest activist on uh, sustainable diets. And it's extraordinary what they're doing, actually. It's very interesting. And I love this sort of world of where localized experiments are going on. It's, it's civil society. I'm almost there. What have I said? I've painted a big picture, which I don't apologize for. I think we're at a point where we have to review history of the last 70 years, the productionist era, post-Second World War reconstruction of agriculture, has been highly successful but highly damaging. And we now know enough that this has got to stop and it's got to change. And the consumption element of that has to be faced. You can't just deal with it at production. The sustainability of consumption is a key, if not the key factor. I think we end up, and that's what Pamela Mason and I end up in the book, as arguing, say this has to be what we've called the SDG squared uh, strategy. Sustainable diets to uh, dietary guidelines to meet the sustainable development goals, and that requires, uh, you know, broad front politics, but it actually raises very delicate and very hard issues that are as old as food issues, namely democracy versus control, and that's why I oppose Qatar uh, versus America. Just think of the the politics of that. It's not lost on you, I'm sure. Okay, that's it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dean. So, thanks for giving us such a big uh, picture. Um, I'm sure it's triggered. Um, I'm sure it's triggered lots of thoughts. Sit down, please. I'm going to sit over there. Um, and people will have many questions to ask. So we'll start with our discussion. Um, professor Jane Harrigan, uh, who's a professor of economics uh, here at SOAS. Um, some of her recent work that work has focused on uh, food policy uh, in the Middle East, uh, particularly looking at the role of food prices in the Arab Spring um, and uh, the following shift to food sovereignty uh, in the Middle East and in Africa region. Um, I just wanted to uh, say a couple of things. Uh, one is that for those of you uh, who use Twitter, uh, you're welcome to tweet and use the hashtag uh, SOASECON. Um, and uh, also for those of you who didn't get the chance to get uh, tea or coffee before, there will be chance uh, after we end the seminar, so don't worry about that. Okay, thank you, well, thank you, Tim, for a fascinating talk. It's a shame we couldn't let Tim speak for longer. 
Um, I've been lucky enough not just to listen to Tim this afternoon, but also to read the first draft chapter of his forthcoming book, which is also called Sustainable Diets. And again, it's a shame that that book's not out, I think, until May, is it next March. year? March next year. It's always a shame that publishers take so long to get these books on the shelf once people have delivered the manuscript. But um, I urge you all to go and buy a copy of that when it comes out in, in March. I certainly will be. It's published by Routledge. Borrow it. Or borrow it, <laughs> yes. Might be a bit expensive. <laughs> no, no, it's not. Anyway, um, thank you, Tim. The three sort of key and critical insights I took from both Tim's fascinating talk and reading <clears throat> the introductory chapter of his book was firstly how topical and pressing this issue of sustainable diets has become. Secondly, how we've ended up in a position that is so far away from sustainability in terms of what we eat and drink. And thirdly, how complex the concept of sustainable diets and associated issues actually are. So those were the key, three key messages I got today and, and reading um, the, the chapter. So I want to talk about each of those three issues very briefly before we open it up for a discussion from the floor. Pressing, why is this such a pressing issue? Well, I think Tim's made it very clear that if we continue to eat following the sort of North American, European dietary pattern, and if middle income and lower income states continue to aspire, as many people in those countries do, to those type of Western um, diets, then the implications are quite devastating. Um, they're devastating for biodiversity, they're devastating for climate change, land and water use, food availability, food waste, public health, and much, much more as well. And um, I think Tim, particularly in his book, really makes a powerful case that we can't ignore this any longer, and if we do so, we do so at our own peril. Now, he provides some fascinating facts and figures. We saw lots of them up on the slides to um, drive this message home, and they all make for pretty alarming and um, depressing reading when you look at that data. But a couple of the key figures that really stuck in my head, um, some of which Tim presented today, some of which are not today but in his book. Well, firstly, one, around 1.7 billion overweight and obese people globally. That's a staggering figure resulting in the fact that between 2010 and 2030, the estimated cost of non-communicable diseases related to diet, that's things like diabetes, strokes, heart attacks, will be roughly 30 trillion US dollars. That's about 48% of 2010 global GDP. That's a huge, huge global cost. Another figure he gives us... And most and, of that at the middle. Middle and most income. of that hitting middle income middle and income. lower middle income countries yeah. that can least afford that huge healthcare bill and other associated mm. costs. Sorry to interrupt. So another fascinating figure, agriculture emits over 13% of all greenhouse gases. Another figure that really, really struck me, I had no idea of this, even though I work on food myself, 220 million tonnes of food waste globally a year doesn't mean much to me, but when Tim says what that's equivalent to, it's equivalent to the annual food production of Sub-Saharan Africa is wasted every year. That's a stunning figure. And approximately half global cereal production goes to feed livestock in order to satisfy our desire for meat and dairy products. So you know, some of these facts and figures really drive home the position we're in at the moment. The second thing I think Tim does, he didn't talk so much about this today because he had very limited time, but I think it's done very well in the book. He traces the way we actually have ended up in this position. So he talks about the huge increase in food production since the middle of the 20th century, but also the fact that this has been combined with an ethos which supports the idea of development as being rooted in the market and consumer choice. In other words, what he calls the industrialization and the marketization of food, which is all part of sort of neoliberal thinking and ideology. So at the same time, he argues that power over land is no longer residing with agriculture itself. It now resides with traders, processors, and retailers, the big food giants. 
who work off the land and who help shape what we eat and drink. But what he does in the book, which I think is fascinating, he shows that the drive to produce cheap food is not really cheap food after all. Um, it has what economists would call major externalities. In other words, external costs that are not usually captured by the market price of food. And to quote from his book, he says, cheap food isn't cheap, extra costs lie elsewhere. So he traces how we've ended up in the particular position we're at right now. And then finally, he tells us what, what sustainable diets really mean. And he sort of carefully unpacks this concept of sustainable diets. And as he mentioned in his talk, this concept goes beyond the earlier simplistic definition where you just combine healthy diet with a concern for the environment. And it's a much more complex concept than that. It involves things like culture, costs, values, production, social norms, governance issues, etc. And he argues and shows how the idea of health and the idea of sustainability are as much social, cultural, economic and policy constructs as they are simply technical issues. And again, to quote from his book, he says, a sustainable diet is one which optimises good sound food quality, health, environment, socio-cultural values, economy and governance. And he uses those six broad categories or those six broad headings in his book to provide the structure for the analysis. So he gives us a really good feel for, for, for what, what we mean by this concept of sustainable diets. And then the final issue um, that sort of I thought was a key issue that came from the talk in the book, and this is perhaps one we can discuss more um, in a second, is what is stopping the transition to more sustainable diets and how do we overcome those barriers and move towards greater sustainability? And here I want to press him a little bit and ask him for for some views on, on, on various issues. He shows this is not just a fringe importance and it's not just a technical challenge, it's a cultural challenge as well. And he also argues that the gap between evidence, policy and behaviour is widening, not getting smaller, and asks how can we stop this? Well, this is a question I'd like to pose. How can we actually get the change and the movement towards more sustainable diets? And I recently had a fascinating discussion with B. Wilson, who some of you might know used to be the food columnist um, in The Telegraph. And she actually has argued in some of her writings that things like national dietary guidelines and a public health approach to, to changing our diets, where government gives the populations messages, gives them guidelines, dietary guidance, uh, doesn't actually work in the sense that the message gets through. We all know we should be eating five fruit and veg a day. We all know it's bad to buy things with a traffic light symbol in the supermarket that has lots of red and green on, on, on the little circle for fat, sugars, unsaturated fats, etc. We all know that, but very few of us really act on it. It's not significantly changed our behaviours. So she's very sceptical of some of the initiatives that Tim was pointing to towards the end of national dietary guidelines, government public health messages to get us to change the way we eat. And she actually approaches dietary issues from a psychological perspective. She argues that eating is a learned behaviour. Humans are one of the only animals not built with an innate knowledge of what is good and bad for us to eat. We learn it as children. And her approach is a psychological approach, starting right off in the earliest years of childhood, that we need to learn how to eat sustainably and we need to learn how to eat healthy diets. And she's talked a lot about fascinating experiments in schools, particularly in some of the Scandinavian countries, to try and get children to change their whole approach to, to eating and diet. So I want to press him a bit in terms of asking him what his views are, particularly on this idea that public health messages, sustainable dietary guidelines are not necessarily the most effective policy measure to get the change we need. <coughs> and if they're not, what are the alternatives? How, how can we really get these changes? I mean, you mentioned towards the end, perhaps it's the big food companies, um, the companies like Barilla, who might with the right kind of pressures, see it to be in their own interest to change 
their behaviours, their advertising, their marketing. Is that the way forward if national guidance from governments don't work? Or is it something which is a much more individualistic approach based on the psychology of eating, which really involves educating parents, going into schools, the Jamie Oliver sort of approach? So I'm quite fascinated to hear more about how we operationalise this whole concept of sustainable diets and how we actually get the change that is really necessary to address the questions and the dilemma that, or the crisis that, that Tim has so eloquently outlined for us. So I'd like to ask Tim that and I'd like to hear from, okay. from anyone um, here. Well, thank you very much indeed. The bad thing about coming to someone like SOAS is you get lovely discussions. <laughs> get to the heart of the matter. I couldn't have wished for something better than that. Thank you. Um, well, you've got it. That's exactly the problem that we pose in the book. Uh, and that's why I was, in a low-key way, saying what our answer is. There's no single answer. I mean, I know, and like in Mexico, by the way, B. Wilson, I've just had spent an evening uh, discussing and debating with her, I know, um, uh, for years. And I'm a great fan of her writing. I mean, she's a really smart historian who's become a journalist. Um, uh, I mean, our, our answer, my answer, uh, both in the book and, and generally after 40 years of thinking about this, is that there's no one answer. I mean, as I reminded B as a, as a historian getting interested in the psychology, I had a PhD in psychology and got interested in the structural issues. The answer is, everyone always says, their area isn't the answer. And that's right. It's because it is a multi-criteria, multi-level problem. Um, and that's where actually I'm going to defend sustainable dietary guidelines because you'll only get the multi-level, multi-factor interventions, multi-agency interventions, multi-actor interventions, if you have a framework which is agreed to be necessary. And that's what we mean by sustainable dietary guidelines. It's about saying that the framework for food for the 21st century has got to be about linking the six criteria that we pose and frame the book around, quality, health, environment, social values, economics and governance. And those six headings bring order to what at the present, the, the neoliberal experiment of the last 40 years, is chaotic. That we know. Uh, but we're not going to have a single answer. If we just said within the social area of our six headings, if we just focus upon child education, it consigns adults to what? You know, everyone is always happy. You'll get political movement around children, always. Even the most recalcitrant anti-nanny state person wants to look after their children. Just. Uh, but actually, we've got to address population change in the next 30 years. Very rapid. It's taken... 70 years to get into this mess, but we've got possibly 20 or 30 years to get out of it. We can't put all the emphasis on reteaching children because that won't deal with the population, I'm talking epidemiologically, the population exposure. So that's the first point. The second point is what I said earlier. I think uh, there are lots of interventions that are po possible. What we have to do is coordinate. Thirdly, as an academic, I've started our masters that we've run at City, what's well, still the world's only masters program in food policy. Although there are a few others about to start up, I'm glad to say, around the world. Because I mean, this is the big issue. Why is there just one masters program on food policy? It's bonkers. Uh, uh, I've said I always start our course by saying, "What's the evidence for population dietary change?" Have a war have a war. That's the time that populations at population level change. And it's the time at which state and capital interventions occur. That's a very sober. I can see all the brains going. The camera should be, the cam, camera should be looking at your faces. I mean, I'm not saying have a war. But I'm saying it's at moments of total crisis that possibilities of big change occur. Indeed, the productionist paradigm we're in was articulated and policy ground seized in World War II. Actually, it's a very good illustration of that. 
But at the domestic level, crises are the moments where people change. When people have a heart attack, they start thinking about their diet that they didn't think about before. When one of their loved ones has a heart attack, they're more prepared to. But then that's just one individual to pick up your, one of your points, Jim. The individual level of change is not enough. It has to be, as the great epidemiologist, just the other side of the square, Jeffrey Rose in the London School of Hygiene and University College, always said, you know, his U-shaped curve, we are here over here, the mean uh, of fat consumption in a country like Britain is 42% of calories from saturated from fat. We need to get it down to about 20, 25, 30. Uh, uh, do we target those who are at the top and try and get them to become reformed eaters? Well, actually, you've got to move the whole curve. So it's got to be at the population level. It has to happen. You will always get variations in populations, even in authoritarian states even in Russian circumstances. So the question you're asking are absolutely right. But our answer is there is no one answer. It has to be multi-level, multi-actor, multi-intervention point action. So it has to be structural. Thank you very much, team and uh, shall we take some questions yeah. from the audience? Sir? We're just clearing our throats here. Can okay, I please uh, ask you to keep your questions or comments fairly short because I'm concerned that many of you want to. Does this, this resonate audience. with you? You all look like you're interested. The camera won't be able to show. They're looking very interested. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to know. They're not asleep. I always expect everyone to go to sleep. We've up our lunchtime, so it must resonate. Which allows me to, 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 to berate Soas for having biscuits. <laughs> biscuits! <laughs> God damn it! <laughs> Questions? Questions. <laughs> Comments? Rude remarks? <laughs> over at the London School of Hygiene and Tropical Medicine, where the master's address nutrition for global health, um, but I have a, a big interest in, in policy assessment. And my question was, uh, you mentioned that we have to walk across the evidence um, and that there's been a bit of academic failure. And I was kind of wondering what you meant by that, if it was sort of in the way we're teaching nutrition to the up and coming people who are going into policy, or if it's that, you know, we've taken maybe two Highbrow an approach and just <coughs> the evidence and not closing that gap. Can you expand on that? I can. Uh, I'm actually delighted you picked up on that because I think I'm at the stage of my life. I'm about to be 69 and I've stood down as a full time running on uh, centre um, where I think I'm sort of looking back upon everything. What have we done? What's my generation done? Well, I think we've helped get these problems onto the agenda. We have had little moments of where the tectonic plates have shifted and we've had moments of entry, but not enough has changed. A lot has changed, but not enough has changed. And I put that bit in that slide because I think part of the challenge we've got at the moment is we're not good at interdisciplinarity. Uh, and that is always a problem. You don't get rewarded for it. So you don't get the Nobel Prizes in interdisciplinary contributions. It's, you know, for this sector or that sector. Um, I do think that is an issue. I think most people, you know, the former head and the current head of the London School of Hygiene are actually very good on this point. Uh, they understand and know that the huge public health calamities the world has to address cannot be resolved just by doctors or by drugs. Uh, they do require multi-level, multi-hector, multidisciplinary interventions. So I think educationally, that means we need to have that element built into our programs more. I don't think we do that well. Uh, I think we need to reward it. Uh, I think it's very hard to be an interdisciplinary academic. The notion of policy is one of the few areas you can get that, actually, because you have to range across, although the, still the pressures are that you specialise in one area. I mean, to some extent, cakes will always be cut up in slices in different ways. You know, you can't do everything all of the time. So one has to be grown up about it. Uh, but 
it is a very important reminder of the need for specialists that we do so well in this country uh, and in Europe and in rich countries. Specialists need to have some, some education in to know what they don't know and to be prepared to work with others and to know that most of the problems that we all deal with cannot be resolved on our own by our expertise if they're listened to at all. Is that an answer? Well, what's your view? Yeah, no, no absolutely. I mean, I, I, I'm from the US and uh, I've brought up my whole life being told I needed to, to specialize and um, choose majors in a particular track. And now I finally feel like I'm, I'm on a track that is, that is interdisciplinary to a certain extent, but there is a pressure to specialize, 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 and you certainly close yourself off to, to other views. And you certainly can't tackle an obstacle like the current food crisis without taking in all the different components. Because it isn't just for doctors, and there isn't just a miracle drug. Yeah, I mean, that's absolutely right. I mean, people like me, social scientists, gone wrong, got drawn to public health. Yeah, because I public that health that is actually the history and the reality of public health is it has to be interdisciplinary. Public health, Jeff Rayner and I, in our book, Ecological Public Health, we, we called it reframing the conditions for good health. Project. Good, you do. Good. Um, if you well, I, just, I thought I'd save you having to uh, fly. Good. A quick thank you to Sarah. Yes, thank you to Sarah. Organizing this first very successful event. So thank you.